Um, thank you all for being here. Um, this is our fourth and final seminar this semester in the series on human-wildlife interactions. And I'm pleased that to end, uh, end our series, we've got Dr. Amanda Stronza from Texas A&M University. And I'll just share a brief little bit of background on Amanda. Um, she's an anthropologist, professor, and photographer with nearly 30 years of conservation experience in the Amazon, the Okavango Delta, and other parts of the tropics. She directs the Applied Biodiversity Science Program at Texas A&M University, and she is a co-founder of EcoExist, a nonprofit organization in Botswana focused on fostering coexistence between people and elephants. And the title of her talk today is Conflict and Coexistence, a Story of People and Elephants in the Okavango. And it's been such a pleasure to have Amanda here this semester. We were just talking about how we're going to be sad to see her leave because she's made a lot of great connections here and is part of, of the network of, of people doing a lot of coexistence work when it comes to human wildlife conflict and interactions. So I'm really pleased to have Amanda and just as a, a little fact on Amanda that's not related to her background <laughs> here and you know what I'm going to say. You're just talking about Matilda. Matilda. Yes, Matilda, <laughs> some of you already know this, she has um, a dog that has internet fame. So you should look up Matilda and Matilda, Matilda's stories and pictures online for more information. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda, and again, we're so glad you're here. <laughs> thank you, Tara, and thank you so much for um, bringing up Matilda. <laughs> and thank you so many of you for coming today. It makes me really happy to see you all here. And I just want to thank the department and all of you at CSU for welcoming me. I just really love it here. I love CSU. I love this department. I love Colorado. If I'm being honest, I feel like I'm having an affair on Texas. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Uh, so today I will be talking about elephants, but I'm an anthropologist and a conservationist and a photographer. So my perspective will be how elephants relate to and interact with people. And my angle will be very applied and from the field rather than theoretical definitely more social than ecological, and I'm going to show you as many of my photos as I can. <coughs> so my, po well, the astute among you will recognize that this is not an elephant. Yeah. This is a tapir from my long-term study site in the Peruvian Amazon. So my passion is in understanding connections between people and wildlife. What influences people to love certain species? or feel motivated to protect or care for them? What influences people to fear certain species or feel indifference or antipathy? For the record, I love elephants and I have a lot of fear of elephants. As a social scientist, my contribution to conservation is in understanding how things like cultural beliefs, uh, social norms, policies and incentives influence our relationships with other species. I could talk for hours about the complicated relationships between people and elephants, but I want to save some time <coughs> for questions and discussions, so I'm going to do my best to limit this talk to 40 minutes, and I'll cover four things. First, human-elephant conflict, what it is and what it means for people and elephants. I want to take you to the Okavango Panhandle of Botswana, a place where there are more elephants than people, <coughs> in a country where there are more elephants than anywhere in the world. I want to share with you some of the work we've been doing as part of a nonprofit organization in Botswana that I co-founded called EcoExist. And then I want to close with um, why should we care about human-elephant conflict? So I'm going to try not to cry when I show you this slide, but I always do. And I just want to <laughs> say that I'm doing my best to represent a whole team of people. Everything you hear me say is not just me. It's coming from a whole team of people. And I want to point out in particular the directors for EcoExist in Botswana, Anna Songhurst, who's the elephant biologist on our team, Graham McCulloch, who's a, this is Graham, a wetlands ecologist, and our three field coordinators, Matata Kashongo, who was recently elected chief in his village, Mujita Mosupi, and uh, Makata Baitseng, who are the other field coordinators, and then each of the EcoExist community officers, we call them ECOs, who represent the 15 villages we work with. 
And then I'm also doing my best to fairly represent the feelings of lots and lots of people in Botswana and also um, elephants. So whether or not you've ever seen an elephant in the wild, it's possible, maybe even likely, that elephants have some significance for you. Many of us have grown up with them in our stories, in our movies, animal crackers. Can you see him? OK, some of you got that. Snuffle up a kiss. <coughs> On the one hand, elephants are unlike any other species on the planet. Richard Leakey has called them whales of the land. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Does that look like a whale of the land to you? <laughs> on the other hand, the more we learn about elephants, the more we see how much they are like us. In their intelligence, their capacity for self-awareness, their memory, family, and social life. Like people, elephants are big-brained and long-lived. They take a couple of decades to become grown-ups, just like people. For some of us, it takes a little bit longer. <laughs> elephants carry a lot of weight ecologically, too. We like to say they are the civil engineers of the animal kingdom. They transform forests to grasslands as they move through landscapes, bringing down trees and vegetation. And with their powerful trunks and tusks, they dig wells that become uh, watering points for other species. And of course, they can be of tremendous economic value as well through the tourism and safari industries. So much of the attention on elephants in recent years, in the past couple of decades, has been on the rapid decline of elephant populations. We talk a lot about the illegal ivory trade, and there's a lot of concern about the plight of elephants, and for good reasons. Um, by some measures, um, we know actually from George Wittermeyer's work here at CSU and his colleagues in a study from 2014 that we lost 100,000 elephants in just three years. The word extinction has been used. This is an elephant I photographed in northern Botswana, where I will be talking about, and you can see that he was clearly killed for his tusks. This is the trunk here, and you can see his face was hacked. <coughs> but there's another story to be told about elephants, especially in southern Africa, where elephant populations are thriving. And that's a story of conflict with people. A healthy elephant population needs lots of room, and there is no single park or reserve that has enough suitable habitat for large numbers. And so we've seen, for example, in places like Sri Lanka, where they've tried to translocate elephants and put them into parks, that eventually elephants break free from those parks, they cause problems for themselves and for people, or they stay in the parks and they really suffer from malnutrition being in a confined area. So the elephant range uh, overlaps with human settlements. Some have said, elephants must live among us, or not at all. It's in these spaces of heightened competition over resources, these places that John Salerno, my colleague in this department, has called elephant landscapes, that we find human-elephant conflict. This is a um, set of three photos that I took in the same spot on a road in just a span of 10 minutes. So you see elephants crossing, then people crossing, and dogs. Um, there were also cows crossing. For some reason, I didn't photograph them. If you're human, human-elephant conflict comes in the form of elephants eating or trampling your crops. We often call this crop raiding. Sometimes they can destroy an entire year's supply of food in just one night. Conflict comes in the form of people destroying your fences or property, or it comes in the form of endangering you or your family. Oh, sorry. Of course, elephants are not predators, but they can be very, very dangerous, especially if they're startled or if they feel threatened. So people who live close to elephants for them, elephants don't conjure images of Dumbo or Horton. 
For people who live close to elephants, elephants signify fear and danger and insecurity. If you're an elephant, conflict comes in the form of people harassing you or chasing you or killing you. Maybe it comes in the form of people blocking your access to resources or water that you need to survive. If you're an elephant in Botswana and you enter a farmer's field, that farmer is allowed, legally allowed to kill you. So if the illegal ivory trade is like a meteorite hitting elephant populations, human-elephant conflict is death by a thousand cuts. Even if we get a handle on the ivory poaching, and many who are working in elephant conservation believe that that will happen, human-elephant conflict, or HEC as we call it, is a real threat that looms for elephants. And yet, we hear, except in this department, we hear relatively little about HEC. It's rare that we hear from people who can tell us what human-elephant conflict feels like, who know firsthand what it means to stand vigil in a field of millet or sorghum in your watch hut and have nothing more than a string of tin cans around your field to scare the elephants in case they come. AGC is not a new problem. It's been documented for centuries. Uh, people report problems with other species as well, raiding their crops. People report problems with porcupines, birds, insects, even cows. But elephants are dangerous in ways that those other species aren't. And a single incident with an elephant can be deadly or catastrophic. So there's extra fear with elephants, and there can be a tendency to exaggerate. So we often talk about um, conflict as being both real and imagined, actual and perceived. So an elephant raiding your crops is definitely a problem. But so is the threat of an elephant raiding your crops. That threat means that you live with constant stress. Sorry, guys. How did that happen? OK, maybe we don't hear so much about HEC because it's not as black and white as the ivory trade. Not so easy to figure out who or what is to blame or what the root of the problem is. HEC is a complex problem. It's connected with the ivory trade, but it's also connected with poverty, food insecurity, uh, social inequality, conflicting land use policies, <coughs> misguided conservation efforts, and the global politics of animal rights. The feeling that elephants belong to all of us, even if we all don't have to bear the burden of living with them. We often say that human-elephant conflict is rooted in human-human conflict. Though so many of us have emotional or symbolic connections with elephants, we don't all agree with each other about the value of elephants or what to do with them. Like the parable of the blind men touching different parts of the elephant and all having the conviction of being right, we perceive elephants differently depending on where we stand. People, rural people who live close to elephants know a different beast from policymakers in faraway cities. Animal lovers who see gentle giants may have no comprehension of the real danger. So that's a summary of HEC, what HEC is. And I should take a moment to say that this university, this department specifically, is like ground zero for a, a groundbreaking understanding and research on human-elephant conflict specifically and human-wildlife conflict more broadly. Um, this university is also incredible for the work so many of you do on large mammal research and conservation. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I just want to say that I'm very humbled and trembling a little bit to be talking with all of you about this. I don't know if, um, can I say that I'm woman-splaining to all of you? <laughs> I was also thinking the analogy might be that I'm explaining basketball to Michael Jordan here. Um, I just want to, uh, again, say how grateful I am to be among you all. 
So now I want to, now that I've talked about what HEC is, um, women explain that to you, <laughs> I want to take you to Africa, to the country of Botswana. It's the nation with the largest population of elephants on the planet, one third of the total population of elephants in Africa. 80% of those elephants roam outside of any protected area. <coughs> the Okavango Delta um, is especially important for elephants. The Okavango River flows from uh, Angola through Namibia and into Botswana and becomes a delta that empties into the Kalahari Desert. So it becomes a real oasis in this desert nation for large concentrations of elephants and other wildlife. 95% of the surface water in Botswana is in that delta. The rest of it is uh, desert. The eastern panhandle, <coughs> where our work is, is a part of northern Botswana that's about the size of Greater Yellowstone National Park, but it's not a park or reserve of any kind. It's delimited by a, a veterinary buffalo fence to the south. It's meant to keep livestock and wildlife apart. The northern border fence with Namibia, and then the Okavango River itself. These are permeable borders, but in many ways they limit easy movement or migration, either by people or elephants. There are 18,000 elephants in this area, 16,000 people. By comparison, uh, Kruger National Park has 17,000 elephants in an area twice the size with no people. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the villages marked by these little icons on a road, a uh, 170 kilometer road that follows the, the water of the delta. This is what it looks like on the ground. This is the permanent water of the delta. I'll be referring to woodlands to the north. And then this is the road that connects the villages. And you'll see pictures of elephants crossing that road. <coughs> So though elephant populations have been declining in most every other part of the world, in Botswana they have been increasing and thriving. In the past, um, just since 1990, the population has tripled, now to an estimated 130,000 elephants. In the panhandle alone, just in the past 10 years, the population has doubled. The, gro the um, annual population growth rate for elephants here is 9% per year. That cannot be accounted for in natural birth and death cycles. And the understanding is that elephants are coming into this part of Botswana from surrounding regions of Zambia, Namibia, and Angola, where the rates of poaching and habitat loss are much greater. The more you look at this photo, hopefully the more elephants you'll see. I took this from a spotter plane. The pilot and I estimated 400 elephants. I couldn't capture them all in my, mm -hmm. in my lens but they're all gathered around this watering hole. So the elephants have always been in the panhandle, but not in numbers like these. So elders in this area in their 60s and 70s will tell you they cannot remember seeing so many elephants when they were kids. And so that means that they don't have necessarily an understanding of how to share space with elephants or how to be safe around them. You can't get to the panhandle unless you charter a Cessna plane or take a very adventurous uh, canoe ride up through the delta, which I would highly recommend we all do someday. Mm -hmm. But the other way you can get there is drive from the town of Maun here in the south following the western portion of the delta. It's a five-hour drive. When you get to Shikawe at the north there, just at the tip of the Okavango River where it enters Botswana, the locals will tell you you're going overseas. That says a lot in a landlocked nation. So it means that the Eastern Panhandle is like a whole other part of Botswana. It's really cut off from the rest of the country. The capital city of Haberone, where the policymakers are, are like a planet away. For thousands of years, this has been the homeland of the San peoples, hunters and gatherers of the Kalahari. In more recent years, we see uh, Hambukushu and Baye and other cultural groups. If you drive that 170 kilometer stretch of road that connects the villages, you'll hear people speaking five different languages. They practice a variety of um, cultural traditions and livelihoods. They gather from the delta itself. They gather um, grasses and reeds and jackal berries and baobab fruits and water lilies. 
They fish, they raise livestock. Um, they go into the bush primarily to collect firewood, which by the way, most of which has been uh, felled by elephants. One of my PhD students is working on that, the mutualism between elephants and firewood collectors. That's a whole other talk. Um, and then they also, they're farmers. They're subsistence farmers. But farming here is unbelievably tough. This is what the soil looks like. It's Kalahari sand. It has almost no nutrients. People depend on rainfall, which is increasingly unpredictable in climate change. This year, by the, by the way, in Botswana, is the worst year in living memory for drought. So people here make do with very little. They don't have things like irrigation pumps, for example. They don't have any kind of um, vehicle transport to get their goods to markets or to transport water. <coughs> Most of the land is tribal, meaning it falls under the governance of the state. So there are land boards with land overseers who tell farmers where they can put their fields and where they can settle. And this will become important in just a little bit. The government in Botswana is very strong. Many have identified it as a welfare state. So they have diamond money in Botswana and a population of only 2 million people in a country the size of France which also happens to be the size of Texas, by coincidence. <laughs> um, so there are a number of subsidy programs. There are short-term employment for people in rural villages. There, are, um, there is a compensation program for people who've experienced loss from elephants and other wildlife. So I'm just trying to give you a picture of what the Eastern Panhandle is like. It's really a beautiful place with unbelievably beautiful people. And it's really hard to live here. People make do with very little. They're subsistence producers. They have very few technologies or any kind of assistance. Um, they're farming in, in what is basically sand with increasingly unpredictable rainfall. There's very little commerce or markets. There's some employment connected with the safari industry, but other than that, there are virtually no markets. Really, the only thing people rely on are their cell phones and donkey carts and each other. And they live surrounded by thousands of elephants. So certain times of year, just when the rains have stopped, just at the same time that people, people are beginning to harvest from their fields, the elephants moved southward from those woodlands. If you remember that watering hall with the 400 elephants around it, that's to the north. That watering hall, that dries up. That's, those are seasonal. The elephants moved south to the delta where there's permanent water. To get to the permanent water, they necessarily come through the villages. And as they get closer to the delta, they'll hear people shouting at them, banging drums at them, They'll burn fires, they'll burn um, chili pepper bombs, which I will explain in just a moment. Dogs will be barking at them. It's a really, really risky endeavor for elephants to come through the villages, but they have to. And when they come through, they use these time-worn, distinct pathways they've followed for generations. And once in those months, starting in March and April, they stay around the villages about 10 within 10 kilometers of the village throughout the day. <coughs> so elephants practice, as they come through the villages, they practice a kind of avoidance behavior. It's very clear that <coughs> elephants here are trying to avoid people, and people are trying to avoid elephants. So specifically, elephants tend to move under the cover of <coughs> darkness and night. They will gather in groups, several family groups, almost like congregating for a parade before they come through the villages. Um, I photographed this last July, and in the span of about 10 minutes, 700 elephants came through this, the village. So my colleague, uh, Anna, for her PhD work, so much of our work is based on, it, on her PhD work. And she, uh, she uh, identified that crop raiding here is more opportunistic than habitual. So there are some elephants that are habitual crop raiders, meaning they will target a farmer's field and enter. But more often, what's happening here is that elephants are opportunistic. And Anna found, discovered that the greatest predictor of whether your field is going to be raided 
is distance from your distance between the field and one of these main corridors. So specifically, if your field is within a kilometer of one of these main movement pathways, your field is twice as likely to be rated. <coughs> So um, the more the crops th that are mo more often rated are millet, and elephants that are more likely to be the raiders are elephant bulls. There are six to seven hundred fields rated per year, and this is the main manifestation of HEC in the Panhandle is this crop rating, as we call it. But conflict involves death too. In the past eight years, about twenty elephants per year have been killed in relation to human-elephant conflict. Some were shot um, in the field, but suffered um, beyond that. As you can see, this elephant, sorry to share these photos with you, but this elephant was shot grievously in his l back leg and has a really bad infection. It's actually quite difficult to kill elephants. So the numbers that we have of mortalities are the ones that we know. Many elephants, uh, perhaps, are shot and go off into the bush, and we don't know about them. In that same eight-year period in which we lost about 20 elephants per year in relation to HEC, um, eight people were killed. And 25 people have been killed by elephants in Botswana just in the past two years. In the Panhandle, um, last year, in the month of August, two men were killed in the same month. And in both cases, they were elderly men who were walking along that main road in the early morning. We don't know exactly what happened, but it seems like they came, in both cases, they came upon a breeding herd of elephants and startled the matriarch, and they were both um, trampled. It's quite devastating, and when that happens, as you can imagine, when a person is killed by an elephant, it's, a, it's like a blow that reverberates throughout the panhandle, and it leads to a real spike in fear and resentment of elephants. And it also leads to retaliatory killings of elephants, both on the part of uh, villagers and on the part of wildlife officers. Okay, so now that I've introduced you to HEC and I've tried to give you a picture of the Eastern Panhandle, I want to share with you some of what we've been trying to do as a nonprofit based in Botswana. We are um, an NGO that we work really closely. We're based in the Panhandle. We work really closely with people in government offices all over Botswana, but especially with the people in those villages. Our work is to reduce human-elephant conflict. And when we came together in 2011, we had some good understanding of the dimensions of HEC in this area, the where, the how, the when, and that came from Anna Songhurst's PhD work. And we wanted to get at the root causes of the why. Much of the work on HEC in this area, in Botswana and other parts of the world up to that point, had tended to be reactive. How do you respond to human-elephant conflict? How do you compensate farmers, for example, once damage has occurred? How do you help farmers keep elephants out of their fields? How do you separate people and elephants, either by fences or parks? And those are all really important pieces of the solution, but we wanted to get at the root causes. We wanted to turn the question around and ask proactively, what will it take for 16,000 people to share a landscape with 18,000 elephants? What are the needs of people here and what are the needs of elephants? So this man is, is Howard Buffett, one of Warren Buffett's uh, sons, and it's with thanks to him that we were given support to develop a five-year plan to reduce human-elephant conflict in the panhandle. That's easier said than done. We haven't solved human-elephant conflict in the five years we had support from Howard Buffett. But what we've, we, what we've done with that support is we've tri tried to create the foundations for coexistence. We tried to think about the problem holistically. Our team is multidisciplinary, multi-backgrounded, multi-experienced, and we wanted to look at human-elephant conflict from as many angles as possible, social, ecological, economic, cultural, and again, try to get at the root causes. We call it, um, it's a little bit of foundation jargon, <laughs> but we call it creating an enabling environment for coexistence. So here are some of the root causes. 
One is a, maybe the most ecological, a basic competition between species, people and elephants. So the population growth rate in this area over the past 30 years, elephants are growing at a, the population is growing at a rate much higher than that of humans. Nonetheless, both populations are growing. Humans are spreading maybe more than elephants, and that's <coughs> land conversion is a real problem. But this is a fundamental root cause of human-elephant conflict, is thinking about the basic competition between species. So I'm going to go back to this. A second root cause is conflicting land use policies. So when the Ministry of Environment doesn't, like the wildlife officer, does not communicate with the Ministry of Agriculture, who does not communicate with the land board, then that means that land overseers unwittingly put farmers' fields right in the middle of elephant pathways. And that's a real problem for conflict. Third is what we identify um, as dependency. So Botswana's approach to conflict, which has really been a kind of welfare state and supporting people through compensation, that's really good. But it can also be a problem in that it can dampen local incentives to, to prevent conflict for themselves. There's also all kinds of problems with compensation. So often it comes late, it's too little, and that tends to lead to even further frustration and resentment on the part of people. And if you remember that part of conflict is perceptions. So that can be another root of the problem. Connected with this is lack of voice. People who live closest to elephants have the least amount of sway in policy um, and decision making. Fourth is what we identify as a basic economic and social injustice. So elephants bring more costs and benefits to people. Elephants are iconic in Botswana. There is a thriving, thriving safari industry in Botswana. That industry depends on elephants. The very same elephants that show up at these high-end lodges are the elephants that are coming through the villages. But very little of the benefits from that those operations get back to people. And people know that. So they will tell you, elephants are the government's cattle. They know that elephants make money for the government, but they feel like they get very little of it. And so again, that leads to feelings of resentment and frustration. So, our work has been trying to address these root causes, supporting the lives and livelihoods of people who share space with elephants, while also concerning the needs of elephants and their habitats. So I'll share uh, just an overview of some of the things we're trying to do. There's so much. I could talk for hours, but I don't want to limit myself. Um, we start by conceptualizing and acknowledging a social ecological landscape. We see this place that is a place for elephants and for people. What are the needs of elephants here and what are the needs of people? If you can remember four things I've already said. So elephants come through the villages um, using these pathways they've used for generations. They tend to be opportunistic rather than habitual crop raiders. Um, farmers are more likely to have their crops raided if their fields are close to these pathways. Remember that farmers are allocated fields by land boards. Land overseers tell them where they have to put their fields. Remember that it's really hard to farm here. That stuff is basically sand that they're farming in. People have very few resources other than each other. <coughs> so our first strategy rests on the idea of protecting those main movement corridors, those main pathways and protecting them as corridors. So in Anna's PhD work, she looked at how elephants were moving through the villages. She did that by documenting their movements on the ground, talking with lots of people, counting spore. And she saw where elephants move most often in the greatest numbers. And then she categorized those pathways. There's over 100 pathways they use when they come through the villages. The blue are the pathways they use. The red is this super highway, elephant highway. The yellow-orange are pathways that are used quite a lot. If you can sort of eyeball that and see that we took that, that data from Anna's PhD work and over lots of consultation with um, uh, tribal leaders and government officers, including the land board, and working with USAID funding on a GIS system for modeling different land uses, those pathways were included in the modeling and 13 of the main pathways were identified as corridors. <coughs> Here's a, the same 
the same view, just a little more information. You can see some of the agricultural fields and the villages. The corridors are two to four kilometers wide with buffers as well. And then they extend nine kilometers back. And so again, with lots of consultation with the government, these uh, corridors are now officially demarcated on the ground with signs. And what that means is that land overseers now and the land boards will not allocate future fields or settlements within those corridors. So they are protected um, for elephant movements. And we always like to say that it's really nice that elephants know how to read <laughs> and they know where to go. Um, so there's a flip side to this as well. There's a social side. The same process of planning that went into identifying those corridors and protecting them went into identifying the best arable lands for people and where to put their farms. So now there's information for those land overseers and for the farmers about where it's relatively safe and where it's relatively okay soil. None of it is good, but where it's relatively okay. And in these areas, farmers are coming together in what are called cluster fields, associations of farmers. They're pooling their resources and knowledge to protect these big fields from elephants. And that has the effect of it's, it's good in that instead of every individual farmer protecting her field with fence and further fragmenting the landscape, the habitat for elephants, now are there are these bigger areas that are fenced off a safe distance from the main movement corridors. Um, so this, there are thousands of hectares now identified as arable land for these cluster farmers. And so far, there are just 300 farmers working together in these associations. Remember, there are 16,000 people. <laughs> there are 300 farmers trying this. So it's a process, right? It takes time. But there's power in these cluster fields. One is that um, farmers are working together. They're helping each other. And when they do that, in this welfare state that is Botswana, the government provides support in the form of fencing. So if you come together, if you work together, you get support from the government. People working together, they also help, the, help themselves. It's much more of a proactive effort to keep elephants out of these big cluster fields. The main tool they use, you may have heard about beehives in Eastern Africa. Here they use chili peppers. They dry the chili pepper seeds and ironically mix it with elephant dung mm -hmm. that create chili bones. They put those around the fields and the, the smoke throughout the night um, is just too strong for elephants. You might have noticed that elephants have an incredible sense of smell. <coughs> they don't like chili peppers. Um, third, uh, people in these cluster fields, they are practicing a different kind of farming strategy rather than broadcasting their seeds and plowing in these big areas. It's a more intensive kind of farming called conservation agriculture. A little bit of jargon there. Essentially involves make intensively digging basins and nurturing that really sandy soil, mulching, building up nutrients over time so that people can farm in a smaller area over a longer period of time, not pushing further into elephant land. And those smaller areas are more productive but also easier to protect from elephants. And then fourth, for farmers who are practicing all those things, they, get, they are getting certified as elephant aware. And my, call, my team in Botswana now is very busy developing value-added products from this elephant aware millet and sorghum. I'm just gonna say the word elephant aware millet beer. Just throw that out to you. And when you go to Botswana, there might be a microbrewery for you guys to visit. Um, the idea, of course, is to create incentives for farmers to practice this these strategies. Okay, so in this strategy for fostering coexistence that involves on the one hand protecting the corridors and on the other hand establishing these areas that are relatively safe for farming, our, th our third overarching strategy is trying to address that social injustice question, the economic imbalance, the fact that people here bear the weight of living with the largest population of elephants anywhere in the world. Part of what we try to do is create what we call an elephant economy. And that's essentially fostering private sector support for local enterprises and tours such that people can generate, can, can get some benefit from the fact that they live with elephants. Um, this has included, you know, the cultural tours and events, locally sourced um, crafts and products. It all falls under the banner of a brand, we're trying to brand it, called Life with Elephants. And that comes, we're trying to put a spotlight on this part of the world. 
with a message that if you love elephants, the best way to protect elephants is to support the people who live with elephants. So each year we host, um, we've started hosting a series of what we call Life with Elephants art, performance, and craft competitions. Um, the basic idea is, well, we're trying to put a spotlight on the area for tourists to come, but we're also trying to create an events that are um, opportunities for people in the villages to come together, learn from each other, and have fun. Um, we have a kind of who's got talent competition. The, je the, the chiefs love to do that. <laughs> people get cash prizes, and all of their skits and plays and songs are either about elephants or about their life with elephants. And people bring, um, come with the most incredible elephant costumes fashioned with the most basic materials, <coughs> but brought to life with so much knowledge and experience of elephants. Um, in the past couple of years, oh, these are posters we had for the event, a couple years in a row. And then in the past two years, what we've done is brought together the winning performers from each of the villages and paired them with a professional choreographer and dance company. And then over the course of a week, the village performers and the professional dancers and choreographer and playwright create um, an act, a stage play in three acts. Um, very professional, we've created a playbill each time, we invite all the dignitaries. Um, I'm hoping to get it to Broadway eventually. <laughs> um, it's our version of The Lion King, but, but with elephants. Um, so this isn't just about trying to bring tourism here and trying to bring employment and income and benefits for people. That's a big part of it. But we also do this so that we can try to build pride in people. You know, people, as maybe you've understood from everything I've said so far, people resent elephants here. You know, they really resent them and they're really angry about them. But people love elephants too. They have an incredible sense of reverence and awe for elephants. People have all kinds of complicated feelings about elephants. It's not like it's just good or just bad. If anything, they love the Botswana elephants. They always tell me, oh, Amanda, it's the ones from Namibia. Those are the problems. So, so we try to harness that, that pride and love that people have and bring them together so that they can share experiences and, and nurture that. Um, and feel better about the fact that they share space with all those elephants. S um, the Panhandle is full of incredible performers, but also um, visual artists. These are some of the winning art pieces. Um, and we created a, muse a museum display of the winning pieces in Maun. Again, just trying to put a spotlight on, this, on the people in this area. We've developed a three-hour Life with Elephants tour. And tourists come from those high-end safaris by helicopter. They come in for three hours. And it's a cultural tour, yes, but they, it's really focused on life with elephants. So they look, they see what a watch hut looks like next to a field of millet. They learn how to make a chili bomb. They look at an elephant corridor and they see the sign and they hear stories from the elders about how they've interacted with elephants over the years. The tourists make fools of themselves. You know how it goes. This is their own logo they've developed. Um, so this is, again, just part of our effort to, to, to facilitate the, these microenterprises. I mentioned that we're developing value-added products from that elephant-aware produce. Um, so these are some of the examples that are underway. <coughs> We've supported a cooperative of basket weavers who have developed a unique design, a design unique to Botswana where there are lots of beautiful baskets. But this is like a signature from the panhandle and it features elephants. Um, and uh, we've sold many of these on a trial basis with 10,000 villages, if you know that store. And then I'm excited to tell you that last month, World Wildlife Fund purchased 250 of these to feature in their catalog. So if any of you get the World Wildlife Fund catalog, you should know that if you buy one of these, it goes call 100% to the women. And the idea, again, is to help people feel like there's some benefit to living surrounded by elephants. <coughs> and again, this elephant economy idea is meant to support and reinforce those corridors and the cluster fields. So everything we do, um, 
is influenced and guided by research. We have an incredible research team. We've had 10 graduate students working with us, five from Botswana, most of them women, I will say, <laughs> um, connected with Texas A&M, Oxford, and then a couple of universities in uh, Southern Africa. These are just some of the publications that are either in the pipeline or have already been published. And the data we're gathering is social, economic, ecological, and spatial, just trying to get a big picture understanding of HEC in this area and the possibilities for coexistence. So as the anthropologist on the team, I will readily admit that the most exciting research involves elephants. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm in the spotter plane photographing Anna here in the helicopter. This is one of the elephants we collared. You can see the collar here. Can you see that collar? So we collared um, 40 elephants since and have since decollared um, since between 2014 and 2018. And that has basically been to try and understand the seasonal movements of elephants. Um, seeing where they go and when, and trying to discern what that implies for conflict and coexistence. Um, I have a whole story that I can share with you if you're interested when I'm done, I'm almost done, about when we decollared this female and her calf was with her. Normally you would never land the hell, you would never dart an elephant with a baby, but we had to in this case. You should invite Anna Songhurst to come back and give you the real talk about all the elephant movements. These are all the data points that those 40 callers have generated. Um, she can tell you so much as the elephant expert on our team what, these, what this data is telling us about the differences between bull herds or bulls and breeding herds, the distances traveled as far north as Angola. Many of them did not come back from Angola, I'm sorry to say, deep into the delta in and out of safari camps and villages. Um, there's so much that we've learned from this uh, movement data. <coughs> a lot of that is feeding into publications, but also we're working with um, World Wildlife Fund and collaborators in a larger area called the um, Transfrontier, called CASA, the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier <laughs> Conservation <laughs> Area that encompasses five countries. And with collaborators who collared elephants in those areas, we're looking at much bigger movements of elephants and how things like border areas um, are um, influencing where elephants go and when, where they can't go, how elephants are valuing the landscape and what the implications are. Okay, so I'm about to wrap up and I wanna get to that question of why should we care? So this one's always hard for me to answer because I feel like for me, it's enough to know that people and elephants are struggling to, to coexist. But my hairdresser of all people <laughs> very innocently asked me one day, Amanda, what's the purpose of an elephant? What would happen if we didn't have elephants? So I guess if we're talking about ecosystem function, and I know there are incredible ecologists in here, we might say, you know, elephants are environmental engineers. They shape the earth. They dig water wells and water holes for other species. They transform forests to grasslands. They are keystone species. There's so much we could say. And what would happen if we lost elephants? Well, maybe some grasslands would revert to forests. There would be a whole series of cascade effects I couldn't even begin to tell you. You all can tell me better. But I think more philosophically, we lose something of ourselves. So all of you know that we are living at a time known as the, as the Anthropocene, a time when all systems are inextricably social and ecological. Humans have influenced every system on the planet. And maybe that makes us feel invincible. But I think when we lose a species, <laughs> sorry, when we lose a species so beloved and so iconic, beings who share so much life history and social history, social story with us, I think we lose something of ourselves. And why should we care about the people? 
I mean, I assume that's obvious. Um, but even if you guys don't care about the people, I know you do. But even if you don't, I think that we have so much to learn from them. Their knowledge and experiences are essential to understand how to be with other beings on the planet. If the Botswana can coexist with elephants, then we, the rest of us, should be able to figure it out with other species, ones that are not nearly as dangerous or destructive as elephants. And then, just some final words about what I've learned from the Okavango. So hard to summarize. Okay, protected areas are important, but we need to focus our conservation efforts on supporting and learning from and collaborating with people where they live. Rather than separating people and nature, we need to think about um, coexistence. That means our work needs to be about these really unsexy things. It's not all collaring elephants. <laughs> think about institutions, policies, and incentives. Human-elephant conflict is complicated. Our solutions need to be complicated, too. We need to look at the problem from as many different angles as possible, including as many different people in the discussion as possible. Certain kinds of people tend to get ignored in those discussions, and I think we need to listen more, especially to the pe people like the people who live in the villages of the Panhandle. Their voices need to be heard more often um, and more loudly in national and international conversations about elephants and human-elephant conflict. Conservation without a keen realization of its vital conflicts fails to rate as authentic human drama. It falls to the level of a mere utopian dream. So I hope that you can take away from this some new insights about elephants, um, a glimpse of the realities for the people of Botswana, and some of the vital conflicts they experience, and some of their hopes for a shared uh, coexistence. And thank you very much. Martha. <laughs> As the anthropologist um, in the group, I know you said that the like, elephant data is like really exciting and people get excited by it, but are there any social science research or projects that are being carried out so that the local voices can, uh, can be amplified? Yes, I love that question. So one of my students who I mentioned, Lauren Redmore, who you guys should all look up, She's finishing her PhD now, and she did ethnographic work in one of the villages, meaning she, you know, so little of what we understand about human-elephant conflict is the subjective experience, like what it really feels like to be terrorized by elephants. And she lived in one of the villages and went out collecting firewood with people, and which is a real, which is a point of opportunity and conflict for people and elephants. So I mentioned that so much of the firewood that people collect, most of the firewood that people collect is felled by elephants, which is kind of a mutualism, right? Um, but people going into the bush to collect firewood means that they put themselves at risk of encountering elephants. So several people have been killed by elephants harvesting firewood. So she's looked at work about that relationship and just collected a lot of narratives from people and stories and more an understanding of what that lived experience is, and I think we need more of that. I hope that you will do that. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, listening to you talk, um, you really emphasize that what you've done is really cross-disciplinary. Well, uh, you know, lots of different lenses are coming in, and I couldn't help but think of the One Health model, um, with yeah. the public health, the environmental health, animal health. Yeah. Is there anybody that's studying the public health effects that this conflict is having on the yeah. community specifically right now? Yeah, I love that question too. So actually, Anna's sister is a psychologist, mm -hmm. and she came out in our first year and was looking at that stress that people experience that I've talked about, yeah. looking at it from like a, a like a personal well-being yeah. perspective. Um, um, but there, but at the larger level, like what have like cortisol levels of people? I've been wanting to do this research that I could never get approved by IRB, yeah. or probably animal use protocol. Is like if we could wire up an elephant and wire up a farmer 
at the time that an elephant is in a farmer's field, <laughs> right? And look at heart rate, look at all the things, because I think that they are, I think that we'd find a lot of similarities. Um, but I love that question. I mean, there's, you know, we need vets working with us as well. And but yeah, the short answer is we, we've done a little bit, but haven't really looked at the public health perspective. That's a good question. Yeah. Yes, Joel. What other kind of uh, species conflicts occur beyond elephants? Yeah. So I didn't even mention that this area has a real problem with lions um, and hyenas. Uh, and that, you know, <laughs> maybe this is a problem that people who work in human wildlife conflict, there tends to be like human herbivore conflict and human predator is like a whole different world. So we collaborate with the guys who are doing work on human lion conflict in this area. And their work is really focused more on livestock, which is something we barely, you know, we're working more with the people who are doing farmer farming. And then there's a whole other set of people who are really more focused on livestock. And their big problem is with lions and hyenas. There are wild dogs here too. All the predators are here, but not in numbers like elephants, lions, and hyenas. And what are the nature of livestock components are those? Uh, goats or those like it's cows cows and goats yeah 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 you should look up um, there's an organization called claws I'll send it to you they're working in this area specifically on human line conflict a guy named Andrew Stein is leading the work in case any of you have heard of him <laughs> yeah this is really cool to see how much work is going on in this community and the um, outcomes from that. I'm just curious, right, for communities that don't have those type of resources, are there, how do you scale this up? Yeah. Or what ways do you transfer to these places where you don't have any resources? Yeah, like that's a great question. You know, it's sort of a blessing and a curse to have a big infusion of support from Howard Buffett. It's mostly a blessing, <laughs> but it's uh, a real challenge. Um, even making that money work for as many people as we did is a challenge because even among those 16,000 people, we really are able to focus our activities only on, you know, certain smaller groups of people. But what we have seen happen is that in different parts of Botswana and in different parts of Kaza, people reach out to us and ask if we can host a, um, a safety around elephants workshop, if we can help people learn how to make chili pepper bombs, if we can share our experiences experiences with the cluster fields. Anna is invited all over the place to talk about the, the establish the identification of the corridors and, and how to put that into policy. And so we get invited and we do as much sharing as we can. But the question of scaling up is a great one. You know, how do we scale up to the level of Kaza? How do we scale up to the level of Africa? By the way, how many times have we been contacted to try bees? Like people write to us every single day. Have you guys heard about the beehives? <laughs> yes, we've heard about that. For various reasons, that strategy doesn't work in, in where we are. There isn't the same culture of beekeeping. For whatever reason, ecologically, bees are not as, as abundant there. Elephants are active at night when the bees are not. So it's, you know, so much as in all conservation work, the work is very context specific. So we need to think about scaling up at the same time, acknowledging that this may not work in other places. But oh, that's a great question. Stu? Yeah. You're going to ask about tourism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been to Botswana once, but it was very limited in the Gavarone University there. They were just launching their International Tourism Research Center. And there was a lot of conversation about the, on the region and I we'll also learned that the strong diamond industry that's there. And so I'm here you describing that peninsula, which is very unique and already had high dollar tourism. Mm -hmm. And now it's an oasis for elephants. Yeah. And so the driving force of the diamond industry, the wealthy and the well-to-do, and the other countries, are they? do they have a chance to develop that or is it because <coughs> Okavanga with the river and the water mm -hmm. flow so you need to yeah. in many of those other countries I just see it's very unique to that place yeah. because of those aspects. You're right. I mean there are so many advantages for elephants in Botswana and it's part of the reason that it's a hot spot for conflict as well. And the advantages are, you know, that it has a, this thriving, extremely high end 
When I say high end, you guys, one night in one of these safari camps is a minimum thousand dollars per night per person per night <laughs> so you've got to be like oprah winfrey to go on safari here um, but they have the policy it's very much high end low volume by design so um, but but relatively little of that gets back to the communities and there's a real need for tourism reform i would say that one of the most urgent needs to address human elephant conflict in Botswana is tourism reform. And maybe you've heard about the debates around trophy hunting of elephants, which I did not even mention in this talk, but it is the debate. The presidential election just last month was determined on the decision about whether to bring trophy hunting of elephants back or not. It has been brought back. Many argue that trophy hunting of elephants is a great strategy for generating benefits for local communities. It can be. But in Botswana, the system is not even really in place to get tourism revenues back to communities, much less trophy hunting revenues, as they should be. But they're working on it. There's a lot of, it's the thing that people are working on in Botswana, is, is, is this social injustice question. It's highly acknowledged that it's unfair that people who are stewarding elephants are bearing the cost and getting so little benefit. So everyone from the president to all the ministries to all the NGOs, that's the real focus now is how do we turn that around. But in other countries, don't ask me about other countries, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's hard enough to figure out what's going on. It's really showing how important that conservation and tourism is. It's very important. It's it's essential. For it's those of you in the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned different forms of tourism, um, conflict and stress and fear. Uh, has there been any anger or fear or frustration directed at eco existence? Yes. And how have you, how has that manifested and how have you handled that? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, I said yes, like overly enthusiastically. <laughs> <laughs> So I will say when we, um, we had some experiences when we were first, <laughs> okay, so we're really building on 10 years of work that Anna Songhurst did before we established EcoExist. And so she had developed a lot of trust with people in the communities and her husband Graham, they'd been living there, so they were a known entity there. And then our camp, all of our work is based in the panhandle, so we're always there, day in, day out, and then 30 members of our team are from the villages. So that goes a long way in terms of building trust and rapport, and nonetheless, anyone, especially if you're white, who's going around you know, wearing elephant necklaces and showing elephant photos, you're sort of lumped in the category of like, oh, you love elephants, you know, and you're part of the problem. And so we have, that has been an uphill, we're just very conscious of it, that every time we talk about human-elephant conflict, we try to emphasize that our work is not to protect the elephants. We care about the elephants, but we care as much about the people. And so we just have to prove that over and over and over. But it's always, you know, and, and then there are times when, as hard as we're trying, there are th things that work against us. So um, uh, it happened one time uh, on that ferry crossing, Graham told me that he was on the ferry with a government wildlife officer who like nodded over to Graham and he's like, hey Graham, how are your elephants doing in front of everybody? <laughs> you know, and that's sort of like, we don't like to think of the elephants as ours and we certainly don't want a government officer sort of reinforcing that idea that we are responsible for the elephants. But it's a great question and right now, the politics of elephant conservation and whether to bring trophy hunting back or not is sort of the perfect storm of real conflict on a global level. And it also involves race politics. So there's a real black-white issue, so that white people are so often associated with conservation. Many times I've had people say to me, Amanda, you know, it's really nice that all of you in the United States love elephants. That's a really nice necklace you've got there. So why don't you guys take the elephants? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just take them? <laughs> you know, they've got a point. Um, so, I love that question. Thank you. I don't know if I answered it, but. <laughs> I think we're out of time, but Amanda, thank you so much. That thank was really you. Awesome. And thank you all again.
again for coming. We do plan to continue the series next semester, and we're seeking input currently for speakers. Um, but this is the last talk of the series this semester. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.